The Eurovision Song Contest is one of the most popular music events, period, of the world every year. It's one of the biggest audiences. Last year, the 2021 competition in the Netherlands reached an audience of 183 million viewers. For perspective, everyone talks about the Super Bowl. Yeah, that's a big event. The game two weeks ago had an audience of 99 million viewers. The Eurovision is a massive cultural event, has been for generations. And this year, the Eurovision people are kicking out Russia. Russia has yet to name a contestant anyway this year. Russia has participated 23 times in the contest since its first appearance back in 1994. Russia won the contest in 2008. Initially, following the invasion, Eurovision officials decided to let a singer represent Russia. But they have since reversed that decision, saying that letting Russia compete would, quote, bring the contest into disrepute, end quote, meaning disgrace. With us now is Asha Westrup Evans, Eurovision super fan and amateur Eurovision historian, joining us down under in Australia. Also with us in studio, Alon Amir, a former jury member of the Eurovision Song Contest, also of the book Three Minutes of Eternity, details all of the crazy going-ons backstage, all of the drama that unfolds before the first note is sung, Three Minutes of Eternity. Alon, you're a former Eurovision judge. I'll start with you here in studio. I mean, do you agree? I mean, you're a former jury member. Do you agree with the decision to ban Russia? Well, I was also head of press for Israel, Belarus, and Slovakia as well. Uh, yes, of course, and I think that should have happened years ago like they did with uh, Belarus uh, last year. They banned it from the contest after, you know, when you're a member of the EBU, uh, your news department has to be independent and in being able to criticize uh, government. That criteria didn't meet uh, in Belarus. Let's face it, it hasn't met in Russia for years now. They should have banned years ago. But there are many authoritarian regimes in Europe that e still compete in the Eurovision. Well, uh, we're talking about Azerbaijan probably. Uh, but now uh, Russia is out uh, because of what's uh, happening. And, and yeah, uh, it should have happened, but it wasn't the EBU's decision. As you said, um, you know, they uh, released a statement saying uh, the contest is about unify uh, Europe. Everyone is eligible to uh, take part only thanks to the Scandinavian and the Baltic countries who uh, stepped uh, uh, up and said it's either us or them. The EBU had to make a decision, which meant Russia is out. There are similar decisions we saw in the athletic fields with exactly. nations simply saying we're not going to play Russia, uh, kind of forcing the hand exactly. there. Uh, on a larger sense, though, you know, I want to ask your thoughts on the ar argument that it's, it does, it's not fair to singers. They're musicians, they're songwriters. They want to perform. They want to share their music. They want to share their joy with the world. It's not fair to punish a singer for the actions of their government. Well, I've been, uh, I've been there, you know, having uh, represented Israel many times. Uh, we were attacked, uh, either demonstrations against us or people throwing things, polit uh, political things in our faces. And we had to remind everyone that we're not politicians, we're singers. We're there to sing, we're there to represent our country. And I always say that I'm a proud Israeli, but I don't necessarily uh, represent the Israeli government. I represent the state. However, uh, in case of war, the artists uh, are suffering as well. Mm. Oh, Asha, I want to turn to you. You know the history well over the years. European mm. politics wars over the decades, uh, have, the, have they played a role? Have the, has it kind of stolen the spotlight in past years during the competitions? Uh, certainly it has, Jeff. Uh, and I would say even more than that, this particular conflict, uh, as we've seen between uh, Ukraine and Russia playing out over the years, has directly impacted Eurovision in the past. Uh, we have saw, saw that in 2016 uh, with the song 1944 uh, heralded by, by Ukraine's uh, entrant in that year. And it, you know, that song was uh, making allusions to the Crimean Peninsula, to historic events that had occurred, but certainly with undertones that were in reference to the events that had occurred just a couple of years prior at that point with Russia taking Crimea. Uh, you know, this this history uh, goes beyond, uh, you know, uh, just simply, you know, the sort of particulars of politics in, in one particular moment. Eurovision 
as much as it, as it is a cultural event, is inherently a political event born out of the politics of the Second World War and will continue to be so whether uh, individual artists like it or not. Yeah, and I believe Russia wasn't even allowed to compete in Ukraine following that victory. I mean, it, it, every year there's drama like this. Uh, they, they were allowed, they chose not to. Oh, they were allowed, they chose not to go yes. to Ukraine and, and, and yes. protest. Yeah. Asha, your thoughts on uh, the EBU here, the role they play, is this a one year ban uh, for Russia? Could it be a multi-year suspension? What are the, the politics at play here regarding the future of Russia's participation? You know, certainly, Jeff, there's so much at stake here, uh, you know, well beyond Eurovision, of course, but certainly looking into this con this, uh, this contest, it could definitely be a multi-year ban, and that, that wouldn't be unprecedented, that wouldn't be unexpected. Um, as Alon, uh, you know, uh, mentioned there earlier, Belarus has been banned in the past, and politics... Uh, is a huge part of, of how the EBU makes its decisions, that capacity to have a free and independent uh, media organization that is allowed to express criticism of the government uh, is a key tenant of the EBU's allowance of participation uh, in Eurovision. This could go on for, for many years, and certainly if Russia were to participate in the near future, given the, the situation on the ground now in Europe, the unity that we've seen in Europe politically against uh, the moves by, by the Russian state, it seems unlikely that they would fare very well, even if they were uh, involved in competition. Does it suck the joy out of the event? I, I don't think it does suck the joy out of the event, frankly. I think, as I said, politics has always been part of it. I, I think politics is a huge part of Eurovision. Um, you know, maybe it's not to everyone's liking. Maybe people just want to be there to celebrate the music. Um, but this is what makes Eurovision weird, wacky, wonderful, exciting and engaging. And, and we've got to in, uh, you know, be aware of the politics as much as we are about the culture and, and the majesty that is all things wonderful and incredible in Eurovision. All right. Thank you so much, Asha, for being with us. Alana, I know you wanted to jump in on that as well. Yeah, I have a lecture about politics in Eurovision. You know, it was established after World War II. And, and one of the first rules were uh, no politics in the contest. It has so much politics in, and, and it's so much fun. It's part of the fun seeing the politics. And, and sometimes it's uh, turned against us, Israel, sometimes against other countries. I know you've been there uh, you know, in, the, in the arenas. You've been judging the performances. You write, you write about it again in the book, Three Minutes of Eternity. The contestants themselves, I mean, the Russians, the Ukrainians, the Belarusians, the, the, the French, the Brit when they're in a room together, when they're backstage together doing best events, friends. do they best talk? Friends. Their best friends. They don't let, I mean, do they let the politics of the no. government? No, we're just good friends. We're not even competing against each other. We're just good friends. We're having a, a good time. As you said, we're artists. Even enemy, even nations that are, they may consider themselves enemies or they're not, they don't have good relations. The individual artists, you think, it's, it's a message, perhaps, It's to not the world. just that, you know, I judged in uh, the Swedish national final and one of the hosts was from Palestinian descent. And I was a little bit afraid of that. And uh, the night before the contest, we met at the hotel, at the lobby, and she came to me and she said, uh, you know that I'm Palestinian. I said, yeah. She said, you know what it means? I said, no. She said, we're family. So, you know, we put everything aside. Uh, we're uh, entertainers, we're singers, we're working behind the stage uh, in the music industry. We're not fighting. Mm. We're almost out of time. Do you think in some way that the contest this May, will, it, will, will they mention the war? Will singers, especially perhaps for your, you know, in some nations, reference the war in some of their selections? Could that play a role? They're not really allowed to talk about that on air, but off-camera press uh, conferences, of course, he'll mm. be part of it. All right. Uh, Alana Mir, thank you so much for your perspective and your expertise on this subject as well. Great to have you on the program. My pleasure.